So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second of our keynote webinars for the Elixir All Hands 2020 meeting. So this year is, of course, a little bit special, but there is also an opportunity in uh, having this as webinars. And so I see that there are many people who join who maybe do wouldn't have the, opinion, uh, the opportunity otherwise. So I'm Niklas Blomberg, the director of Elixir, and it's my pure pleasure today to welcome Dimitris Koreas to uh, uh, to the Alexa All Hands meeting. So Dimitris is the program director and the head of department at the Naturalis Biodiversity Center in Leiden, uh, Netherlands, but he's also the coordinator of DISCO, which is a new research infrastructure that brings together all the scientific collections from Europe's natural history museums. And before joining Naturalis, Dimitris was with the Natural History Museum in London, and so I, I think it's fair to say that over many years he's taken a very, very active role in shaping the field of biodiversity informatics in, in Europe. He's also been uh, working with the RDA as a tech, on the technical advisory board, and he's also been uh, president of the Biodiversity Information Standards International Organization. So it's, it's really great to have you here with us today, Dimitris, and uh, it's been really nice to see you over the last year. We worked a little bit together to strengthen the sort of biomolecular biodiversity links and access. And, and so I hope today's keynote would really inspire us to build even more momentum. This is a very exciting and rapidly developing field. So um, it's, it's great to have you here. Thank you very much, Nikos. Um, I hope you can see my screen and also you can hear me well. Um, so first of all, I would like to extend my huge thanks to you personally and, and Jerry for um, sending this invitation to me. Uh, and also to the whole Elixir team for the support in making this happen. Um, I feel quite privileged to be talking to the Elixir community. Um, it's, it's an infrastructure and a community behind it that really has inspired us a lot over the last years in how we would like to develop um, the new research infrastructure DISCO. So I'm, I'm really glad to be giving this um, talk and also I'm looking forward to see how we can strengthen the collaboration between the collections communities um, in Europe and the Elixir community. So um, I'll start the presentation. Um, my title is Electric Butterflies from Field to Bites and Back. And I had an alternative title for this, which I will show you later on. But before I do, I would first of, all, uh, first of all, and probably quite unexpectedly, I would like to start with this slide. This is the object that helped define the international standard of mass. And uh, you all know about it. Uh, certain the prototype has been held and copies of the prototypes have been held across institutions globally. Very recently, this standard has been now fully digitized. The international standard of a kilogram is now basically defined by the um, uh, Planck constant. So the next time you want to basically calibrate your instrument in terms of the mass, the only thing you have to do is look at the inside part of your arm where you have tattooed that Planck constant. And that has completely basically um, replaced the need for the physical object, which will be uh, we have been holding for the last uh, hundred years, hundreds years of years. So it took a long time for this challenge to express this a single physical property, the physical property of mass, unambiguously into data, i.e. a mathematical formula in this case. Now, I would like to introduce you to this. This is specimen Linnaeus, 2818 has been sitting very comfortably in one of our collections in London for the last couple of centuries. Now, I'm sure this is not a very nice picture of it, so I had a better one for you. Why I am presenting this specimen? This is what we call a type specimen. So is an object that we use to define the concept of a species, specifically the European honeybee. 
this is the object by which we and the description around it that helps us really understand whether an organism belongs to this species or another species. So similar to the, let's say, the, the prototype that of mass that I showed you before, in biological diversity, this is a standard. So we also have standards in biological diversity, in understanding the biodiversity of this world. And those standards are being held by multiple institutions, which we will call collections from now on, across the world. But unlike the prototype of mass, transforming this object into its digital entity, into a mathematical formula or to data, is way more complex than just expressing uh, it in a uh, constant. So a type specimen is a standard, a standard of life. We have approximately 3.5 billion objects held in institutions around the world that help us define approximately 10 million of those types. And by those 10 million types, we have today what we know as biodiversity of this planet, which more or less is encapsulated in the description of 2 million species. So 2 million standards. And every single collection, every single institution that holds collection around the world is more or less a smaller or a larger piece of our planet's biological diversity understanding and of our planet's geological um, diversity understanding, because those collections also hold usually biological and geological specimens. Now, you might be wondering how many of those we have. Very many. Um, in fact, there is no country or even big city in the world that does not host a natural science collection. And that really tells us how important those collections have been in the past in underpinning the biodiversity sciences across the world in a world where access to those collections was extremely difficult. So basically what we had to do <clears throat> is develop them locally so that scientists can have access to them. And over the years, we've managed to really be very productive in understanding life on Earth, understanding biodiversity. But we haven't been actually so successful in the sense that today we have approximately described 2 million species, the 2 million species that we know. But the models say that we still have to describe approximately another 18 million species. We will call them 18 million dark taxa, dark taxonomic units. So from all of these collections around the world, we've managed up to now to more or less know only 10% of the life on this planet. And if we really want to scale up, and if we really want to improve the way we describe biodiversity, it is essential that we provide better access and more capacity in our way to extract, mobilize and link data from our global collections. There are plenty of challenges in unlocking, unlocking that data. First of all, in terms of digitization. Digitization, sensu lato, in the general sense, is extremely low still within the collections globally. We have less than 10% of our collections somehow digitized. That means even catalogued. I'm not talking about fully digitizing in terms of um, images or 3D models of them. We still lack behind a lot in terms of integration and interoperability. We lack behind in terms of adopting common policies across our collections in terms of access, in terms of mobilization of data. And we're still quite behind in terms of the digital skills and competencies that the people that work with those collections or benefit from the information derived from those collections need to have to be able 
to really scale up in um, the level we need to be able to address all our challenges. Now, Europe has a very prominent position in the world of biological and geological collections in the world. Only within the European collections, we hold approximately 55% of the world's assets. We have 1.5 billion specimens held across institutions only within the European continent. And that represents approximately 80% of the world's known species. With 5,000 full-time scientists, 25,000 scientific visitors every year in our collections, 10 million public visitors every year, and 25 million web visitors in our portals across the European continent. So there is a lot of capacity within the European museums, within the European collections, and there is a lot of history behind those collections that allow us today to position Europe at the forefront of collections and biodiversity studies. But if we really want to scale up, if we really want to achieve the kind of science and the level of um, and the rate of new description of species that we need, it is essential that we bring together all of those European collections and transform them into a single European virtual organization. And this is exactly where the concept of DISCO, the distributed system of scientific collections, come in as a new research infrastructure. Today, DISCO brings together 120 museums, we call them national facilities, across 21 European countries. And it represents the largest ever formal agreement between natural science collection facilities ever. We aim to have a centralized CERC governance model that we really start handling and working with these collections as if they were part of a single organization. And of course, we're working towards the synchronization of those facilities in terms of access to data and also at policy level. So we talk a lot about specimens. We talk a lot about the importance of those specimens. But many people still struggle to understand why we hold all of these billions of objects. What's in there? What's in the museum specimen? Well, from the research perspective, a specimen is nothing more but a collection of data. We hold those specimens for hundreds of years, apart from their cultural value, from the importance of documenting nature, because we want to have a reference to the data that we extract from the study of those specimens. And what kind of data do we extract? A series of different data types, from genomic data, biochemical information, morphological data, geographical data, taxonomic information, species interactions, and ecological information about the, um, the environment in which those specimens were collected from. So there is a series of different data types that we've been extracting for some of them hundreds of years, and some of them, because the technology allowed us, for tens of years. And maybe in the future, we will be able to extract new kind of information from those objects. And all of that information, the occurrences, the taxonomy, the genomic information, the traits, the literature, which is linked to those descriptions of new species, the species interaction, the nomenclature, there are already organizations, there are already places where this data goes to. So we have GBIF, the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, Catalog of Life, the INSDC databases, of course, including ENA, EOL, the Encyclopedia of Life, our nomenclatures, the IPNI and Zoo Bank, Treatment Bank, Globi, the Global Biological um, Biotic Interactions database. And all of those repositories, aggregators, organizations, have had the sole task of actually making sure that all of that information we extract 
as a permanent accessible place where scientists can always refer to. But unless we maintain the link back to the specimen, we are unable to make assertions about links between those type of objects. So the specimen, the object through which any of those observations came from, remains the centerpiece for how we are connecting all of that information back together. But again, we have scientific names. And scientific names have been the holy grail on how people, not only within biodiversity, but outside biodiversity sciences, have been referring to the biological knowledge. And taxonomic names, scientific names, have been essential in this. They connect the internal world of biodiversity studies with any kind of other information linked to biological knowledge. And then, of course, in this way, we can make assertions about links between sequences and for, um, raw materials or chemical co compounds and raw materials, which is probably more appropriate. Conservation policies, ecological studies, and all of those traits that then are linked to the taxon name. But the traits linked to the taxon name are effectively not linked to the taxon name, are um, inferred by the links to the specimens. So how effective have we been in maintaining these links back to the specimens in our practices from day to day, in our scientific practices? Not extremely effective, I would say. Let's see a few examples. This is a record from ENA, and this work is work um, done by an MSc student in the University of Leiden that very kindly uh, were provided to me. This is a, a record from ENA, and if you see in the specimen voucher area, the specimen voucher is referred to as five. Now, I'm not certain which, of, which one of the 3.5 billion specimens we hold in our collections that five refers to, but I'm sure it will be extremely difficult to make an assertion on what which exactly that is. So we are almost unable to reproduce the link back to the specimen from this record, unless we go to the publication and we're lucky enough to actually find a more appropriate reference to that specimen voucher within the literature that then allows us to link the sequence to the specimen. And this is another example where we have a bit more information provided in the specimen voucher, but basically this is not a machine actionable um, entry. For someone to be able to really identify that specimen, they really need to go deep into the understanding on how that institution is providing accession numbers to their specimens. And it will probably require a lot of people in this value chain to be able to really point to the final specimen. But of course, this is a much better way of linking and providing that reference information than before. And I could bring similar examples from other um, uh, parts of the biodiversity knowledge space, literature, chemical compounds, and so on and so forth. So we, we suffer from that inability to persistently and must, in a machine readable and actionable way, always be able to link back to the specimen where information has derived from. So I will call this the 404 channel challenge in biodiversity science. Despite the fact that you probably won't read the 404 page, those references within existing databases, most of the times, link to non-actionable, non-readable um, pages or even not that. So there is a problem around how we, within the biodiversity science, can maintain those links 
can curate and maintain them in a persistent way. way. What if we could really digitize our specimens, but at the same time maintain all the links that that specimen points to in terms of the information derived from them, sequences, the occurrences, the collections, the traits, the publications. This would allow us really to build new assertions about how we link this kind of data, link sequences to traits or occurrences to taxonomy in a way that is really able to va be validated, is reproducible, and it has all the provenance information. It is this kind of science we really need to promote. Science that is based on robust evidence. Science that really can go back into the, the, the source and validate or object to the assertions made by others. And this is why the collections are so important because they always provide this kind of reference point where everyone can go back, even if information has been collected hundreds of years before. We will call this a, an extended specimen in the sense that really um, collects all of that information around that specimen and links to that information around the specimen. But still, this does not solve the problem. And the problem is, how do we reconstitute the missing links? Well, I would argue that there are probably three steps that we need to take. First, and probably most of all, stop making the problem bigger. That means we need to adopt policies that dictate best practices and are passed on to tools on how to support our scientific community to understand how they need to better make reference and use deposition processes of deposition so that they maintain as much as possible the integrity of the links. So I think this is probably number one priority because the more we continue on the same practices, no matter how good and effective mechanisms you put back to solve the problem of the backlog, you will always come up with new issues. The second is capacity. Identify the issues really at the granularity needed, raise our awareness, train people, build on that policy, build capacity on top of that policy. And the third one is the technology. Not only in terms of um, of, of, of the machines that can help us, but also in terms of the tools that humans can use to go back in the backlog and improve the lost links or reconstitute them. So to process this backlog of broken links, we can really deploy algorithms. And we have already a few examples on how this could work. Algorithms that can really work towards link prediction and link validation, where they can give us back levels of confidence in terms of that assertion and by human having humans in the loop you can actually then have a more accurate prediction or more accurate validation of the link between a specimen and a data type uh, deposited either in DNA or in the literature or in another uh, repository. So in DISCO, as I said before, we have these 120 national facilities really trying to transform the landscape. But it's not about the data only. It's about how these infrastructures really help address all of these three steps I mentioned before. And I see this also not for DISCO, but all the infrastructures that are serving their respective communities in terms of policy, capacity and technology. But none of this will work unless first and most of all, the institutions that participate realize that infrastructures like this work only when they are linked with their ability to change their entire business models. We cannot 
do new things with old ways. So we need to change. And that change does not come only from the top. It needs to come predominantly from the bottom, from the institutions themselves, from the users and the researchers within those institutions. So what we usually say for DISCO is that we introduce a new business model of our collections, where we have European collections seen as scientific assets in, in their unity, where common collection development strategies are in place, where we can achieve economies of scope and scale together rather than individually, where we put mechanisms in place that can really track the use of those objects. In the 1.5 billion objects that we hold in the European collections, many of them have never been seen by any scientist, any individual, whilst others have been essential for understanding life on the planet. So we need to know which of those objects are more important for taking things forward. And we need to develop specialization strategies across our institutions at the national level or institutional level. And things like this will allow us to really build our joint research agendas to support science not as individual organizations but effectively as one organization within Europe. This is a just to give you an idea and I will proceed with this because this is not the most important part of, of my talk but this is the, the disco development framework. You will see that we are now, and as Nicholas said in the beginning, we are in our preparatory phase as a new infrastructure um, that comes in um, to unify the European collections. We have an implementation phase coming up and an operational phase planned for 2026. And you will see here how the development framework is matched against the, the funding framework, which is always very important, and of course the governance structures that are uh, put in place in relation to the needs of the different phases. So our governance changes as the need of the phase that we are embarking on changes. DiscoBio 2025 anticipates to have three different categories of services. The e-science services, a one-stop shop for uh, providing unified discovery, access, interpretation and analysis of complex linked information around specimens physical and remote access, and support and training services. But let me focus a bit on this. As part of the essential process in developing this infrastructure, we would like to embark on what we call the transformation of the physical object into their digital surrogate. Remember my original few first slides talking about the digitization of the standard of the mass or the digitization of the European honeybee specimen, type specimen. And then link that to what I said about how we really need to maintain the links between the specimens and the information derived of that specimen. And to the whole package of information, we need to give it an identity, the identity of the digital specimen. So this is the concept of creating the electric butterflies, which is also a term that I borrowed from a colleague, Alex Hardesty. So how we really move from the physical object to their digital surrogates that are represented in the web as fair digital objects and constitute what we call actionable knowledge units. So they encapsulate the entirety of the information that the physical object would have given to a scientist if it was studied on the physical space. And of course this is a bit more technical but this is how in practice a digital object, a digital specimen would look like. And I would like you to see that actually the information about that specimen sits outside the specimen itself, the digital specimen. It's only the links to the different data types that are sitting within that specimen. So, of course, the sequences will remain being held and curated where they are currently, and the occurrence information will still remain where it is today. 
and of course the taxonomic information will remain in the global um, um, structures and solutions like the catalog of life that we have today. But the digital specimen will be able to encapsulate and represent all the different links that constitute that digital surrogate of the physical object and serve that as such to the communities of practice of interest. And for me, this is probably the most important part, that this kind of a transformation allows us really to move from what we call the physical scientific curation. So the need for curating the information on the object itself to a digital scientific curation. And why that is important? Well, within our collections globally, we lack taxonomists. We lack the expertise. The number of people who really hold expertise to study those collections is declining. None of our large collections globally hire enough personnel to be able to scientifically curate all the different um, taxonomic groups that we hold. So unless we outsource this scientific curation from the institution to the community, we would be unable to really scale up to the level I, we needed and I described in the beginning. So we need to pool the resources of the scientific expertise and be able to capture all of those annotations, all of that curatorial process, not on the physical object, but on its digital circuit. This is part of this transformation of the business model of the way that our community works with collections. And it is only because the existence of infrastructures that we can achieve this kind of visions. And of course, we want to move from this slow, expensive, inefficient, and very limited way of accessing the collections to a much more effective one. As I said, we had 25,000 researchers every year moving from one country to another to visit one of those collections. Obviously, for the last few months, this was completely out of the question anyway. And we ship around 800,000 objects from one place to another every year for the same reason. That comes to approximately an annual cost of 70 million euros a year just to ship people and, 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 and specimens around. And that's only for Europe. So we need to embark in a much more meaningful way, a much more efficient way of accessing that information. So DISCO comes in as a first mass scale initiative to reunite and serve all of the information around the specimens um, in a way that hasn't been tried before. But if we really want to reach the scientific objectives, DISCO or any DISCO, any research infrastructure, is not enough. This is not the challenge of one infrastructure because it's not the challenge of one community. The challenges of understanding life on Earth is challenges that really multiple communities need to embark on as they have in the past. And that translates into the need of research infrastructures to start collaborating, representing and providing these trust environments for their respective communities. So, have we done enough in collaboration of research infrastructures in Europe? Building robust research infrastructure interfaces for me comes down to three main principles. Science, in terms of identifying the joint use cases, supporting trailblazing projects, focus on quality and trust of the information, effectively building our joint research agendas between infrastructures. Data and technology, semantic and syntactic interoperability, researchers' identities, common researchers' identities, shared researchers' identities. This is extremely important in how we enable access between the services of different infrastructures the infrastructure should follow the scientist and not the other way around. So develop together a set of commons, technical commons that allows us to build 
that's interoperable environment. And finally, strategy. In terms of how together make the cases to influence science policy, how we engage with the society together as organizations, and how we build jointly business cases on how we want to proceed in the future. So basically, it is a concept of collective positioning between infrastructures. And many of these are being done already within what we call the, the cluster activities in, in, in the S3, at least, uh, landscape. But the, S, the cluster activities only include um, organizations that nominally belong to the same theme. Environment, health and food, social sciences. How would Elixir and Disco work together in the concept of the cluster projects? So we need to find really the use cases that drive this collaboration beyond the thematic boundaries that nominally these infrastructures belong to. And we see very interesting examples for this. At national level, first of all, there are plenty of opportunities where we see this need for collaboration of infrastructures translated to national projects. I'm bringing here a, one of those examples. Very recently, a few weeks ago, the uh, a Dutch consortium that we uh, I participate was um, uh, entered the national roadmap of research infrastructures in the Netherlands with a project called Arise. This is a 13 million euro project um, as part of the national roadmap to proceed with the rapid identification of biodiversity in the Netherlands. We're talking about a species identification engine that relies not only to the information coming from the collections, but also to all the assets that are mobilized from infrastructures like Elixir, LifeWatch, in terms of services for analysis, and LTR. And if you see on the right-hand side of the slide, you will see that sequences and specimens IDs are there one of the most important missing elements or challenges for proceeding with this kind of projects at national level. But of course, the collaboration of those infrastructures is a very tangible at national level, but can be achieved also at a European level. So this is another example of a project proposal that Elixir, both Elixir and Disco and other infrastructures have come together to really support the um, uh, scientific processes, not only as part of accessing the infrastructures themselves, but as the process of enabling users to move their data from one infrastructure to another, as part of supporting the entire life cycle of, of, of data. And I'm sure I can bring other examples on how infrastructures can and should collaborate together. But if you see both of those examples, they're not driven by the fact that we belong to the same, the same thematic area. They're driven by the actual scientific need that dictates modes of collaboration, either at national or at a European, and hopefully at an international level. And there couldn't be a best time, a better time, to really talk about the collaboration of infrastructures for the environment. We sit at the, at the center of the most important science, transform, science policy transformation in Europe, with the European Green Deal being the number one, at least a few months ago, the number one priority for the new commission, and the European Open Science Cloud being the number two priority for the new commission in Europe, and with a new 2030 EU biodiversity strategy into place that actually supports also the European Green Deal. So what is the role of the European research infrastructures in this? My opinion is that it's a fundamental role. Is a main, infrastructures are the main, main vehicles through which we can really deliver the scale, the trust, and the robustness of the information needed for this kind of science to be achieved. Infrastructures are not only technical constructs. They actually light up the way for new science. 
Science is a light better at Denver. Research effort is not directed at areas where the work is technically infeasible. It's directed where the work it is feasible, where real and interpretable, interpretable results can be obtained. So, as I say here, we do in fact conduct research where the light is better. But when the light changes, so does science. Research infrastructures provide this illumination of a new paths for science. And for that are extremely important on how we achieve and how we serve our challenges for the future. So I will stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>